again, happy to have you all here yesterday. It was a great, a really interesting and, and exciting um, a beginning to the hackathon. Uh, we've had an amazing workshop as well, and we will be continuing with the same pace today. So expect two more workshops. Um, a lot is coming to this uh, to this stage in a second, and we'll do a deep dive into the storage of the smart contract. Hey, Vlad. Hello. Um, how are you? All good? Oh, it's great. And how are you, sir? Amazing. Yes, very good. Uh, happy to see what you have in store for us. Um, yeah, uh, feel free to uh, share your screen, address the public, uh, and yeah, present. Great, great. Um, so hello, everybody. Hopefully, everybody doing good and ready to dive deeply <laughs> into the storage of ink smart contracts. Um, so my name is Ladislaw, or you can just call me Lad. Uh, feel free to ask questions uh, during the presentation in chat. Feel very free to answer my question during the presentation, and uh, we will answer every question um, to <laughs> the ends of our abilities by the end of the presentation as well. Um, so let's go. Uh, yesterday, you've had uh, um, an introductory uh, lecture with uh, Piotr about ink smart contracts. So here is a little code snippet with ink. <laughs> uh, hopefully it is familiar to you already. Um, so what's happening in here is that we are defining a storage for our smart contract in ink. Um, we want to use uh, the mapping. So we have this declaration of use ink storage mapping up the top. Then we declare that it is our storage above the structure and uh, define our fields inside. Uh, there are many funny things happening around that. As you can see, there are some strange types in there. Uh, these types like balance, account ID, also the mapping. Uh, all of them are provided by ink. Uh, for mapping specifically, you need to use uh, the storage mapping crate. Uh, but everything else uh, will be in there with your ink storage and everything ink related by default. No need to uh, include everything like for account ID for balance. It's in there for you. Um, so, yeah, um, let's get right further. Um, so how is it all stored in the end? Uh, Ink uh, smart contracts palette provides this codec called scale, um, which is simple, concatenated, aggregate, little endian. Uh, a lot of scary words in there. Uh, hopefully everything is understandable in there. If not, then feel free to ask questions. So what does it do in the end? Uh, it simply stores uh, like in your general database. In every cell, they have this key for the cell and the value which is stored in the key. Uh, everything of value side, and well, basically actually the key side as well, is encoded with scale. Um, and what it does basically, uh, I've given you generously some examples, uh, how it encodes some primitives. Uh, for example, for Boolean, it would simply encode it as zero and one in hex form uh, for false and true. Um, integers do the same trick. Um, I would like to remark though that not everything strictly encodes in hex. So if you want to encode something yourself, please do use the scale methods for encoding and the same for decoding. No need to do the hex stuff yourself because you might get something wrong. Um, and well, for more complex stuff, uh, if you remember the name, uh, include the concatenated word for the more complex stuff like vectors and tuples it simply concatenates them together for vectors specifically it would also store the uh, amount of elements at the beginning as well um yep so uh, you can see some types which you can use, typically use within ink uh, and there is one type specifically of primitives, which is included in every other language, but not included in ink 
and as the matter of fact in any other um well anything which dwells with the uh, uh, blockchain which is flowed maybe somebody can tell us why is that the case why is float not included i'm not sure how it would work maybe raise hands or something <laughs> And we won't be able to add people to the stage, but they will be able to reply in chat. So you can have the open uh, the uh, chat section open by the side, and you should be able to see some responses. Yeah, but I, then I need to possibly stop sharing this window. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, it's all right. Are you on a single screen or setup? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, that complicates it. <laughs> Uh, the response is basically coming in chat. Uh, we've previously had issues with like bad, act bad actors, so that's why the only the speakers and uh, people leading the event actually being invited on stage. Um, and so the actually chatting. Understandable. So hopefully there was a reply in chat for the question. <laughs> and the correct answer is basically that floats are uh, prone to some miscalculation. Everybody and their mothers define the floats operations however they want. They are hardware dependent, they are library dependent. So in blockchain, you cannot have this, uh, you know, uh, non definance <laughs> uh, You need everything to be strictly and well-defined uh, so that everybody agrees upon everything up to last bit. So that's why we're not using floats and that's why they're not included in ink either. Um, all right, let's go forward. We are returning back to our beautiful code snippet and we will talk a little bit about packed values. Uh, so, by default, uh, if you remember, we use this scale encoder and it uh, encodes everything for us and stores everything in cells. So by default, every value is packed. So that would mean that every value will be stored under the same cell. It will just sort of keep everything together neatly and nicely packed for you. So that if you, will, if you were to address something, um, and use these stored values. They will be loaded from uh, these storage into your smart contracts and then you would be able to operate upon everything. Um, it is the default behavior, uh, notably if you define the behavior otherwise or the standard library does so for you, then they will be stored differently. Uh, but let's uh, pick a little sneakily inside our metadata here. And what you would see uh, is uh, that there is this default key and it is default for everything, uh, which is zero. And uh, our um, field total supply, which had balance type, is stored under this address. Uh, I would ask the question here, but I would probably just answer immediately since the chat is unfortunately unavailable. Uh, but if you were to add some other field afterwards, uh, it would too be stored, uh, I mean, the default field without any magic around it. Uh, it would be stored afterwards immediately with the same key. Um, but, but, um, Ah, yeah, right. Also, you can modify the key so it wouldn't be default. It would be the one which you uh, neatly uh, write in, in the, this field. So for that, for that you, you would need to include uh, the storage key from storage traits and the uh, manual key. Uh, so you, you would define uh, the manual key for your structure and just like that. You can obviously put in anything you'd like, as long as it not overflows the address. And uh, well, it, one, it then will be the default address uh, for your uh, for, uh, default key address for your storage. Uh, and then if we would were to pick into our metadata again, after recompiling everything, uh, you would see that it is neatly packed into this very address, which we defined previously. Uh, it would also be the root address for your struct. Um, all right, so the unpacked values, surprisingly, we return again to the same code snippet, 
Uh, and there are, in fact, some unpacked values in there as well, um, namely mapping. Um, mapping is uh, another type defined in the storage grid. Uh, so um, with it, with the way it defined, uh, it uh, behaves a bit differently from our favorite balance above. Uh, it consists of the key value pairs as well. Um, and these key value pairs, they are stored uh, uh, in different contract cells, storage cells separately. Uh, so, and it would be the same for each separate value. Also notably, they are not, uh, they are not consequentially stored. So uh, there's no sequence inside of there. You would have a hard time iterating over that. Um, pretty much impossible, and it is not implemented uh, in the default storage mapping type. Um, so what would it mean for us if we were to pick into our favorite metadata file? file sorry, <laughs> um, We would first take a look at the left part over there. Um, so you can note that uh, with the default implementation, the address, the root address would have been zeros. But we can see that the key of our uh, values here are different than zeros. They are stored somewhere else. And the same for the other map as well. It is stored somewhere else in the storage. Um, so I've done some magic <laughs> with, the, um, with the struct above. And it has changed the keys. Um, there is a notable part of metadata mission as well, which would be on the next slide. And uh, just for the sake of it, right in the chat, why do you think the keys have changed? <laughs> um, yeah, there could be multiple reasons, of course, uh, but it would be a reference to what we have done before that, namely, We've changed the root key. We applied uh, a different default root key for our struct, and hence uh, the key for our uh, mappings have changed as well. They are formed uh, uh, with the root key in mind, uh, and basically a sum of it. Um, so, yeah. Um, let's do some magic with mapping as well. Um, this code snippet is a bit wrong, so the compiler will probably tell you that as well. Uh, why not, but it probably will. Uh, so what are we doing here? Uh, we basically uh, get some color from our environment. Um, we get the balance. Uh, we want to increase the balance by this very good and classy value. Uh, we get the balance from the mapping, right? Uh, we unwrap it uh, if there's nothing or something which we don't want it would just give us zero instead if there's something it will give us uh, the value of balance and then we want to do this neat operation which would increment our current balance by um, the value we want to increment by um, well the question is why would it not work and the answer actually comes from our previous lecture with pete um you've done this as well so if anybody has a good memory or maybe experience they might give an answer what's wrong with the code um and what, what's wrong is basically uh when you unwrap the value of the map uh, with the get method or you would basically just get a copy so if you were to increment this uh, um, you would just increment the local variable and it wouldn't be stored anywhere so yeah, to store it somewhere, you need to set it back uh, to the original mapping, uh, which you do by simply this method here. Uh, yeah, so be careful with stuff like mapping. Make sure you save what you've done. <laughs> uh, these bugs can be annoying sometimes to track. Uh, so yeah, be careful with the mapping, and, but use it for good. <laughs> So another way, another way to uh, store your values somewhere else by another key 
is to use the laser storage uh, type. So how you do that? You simply use this uh, uh, lazy uh, type here, uh, just like that on the uh, field of the struct. Uh, what 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 it will do uh, is uh, it will simply store it by another key, and you can even manually define it. Um, so there's a neat picture for you. <laughs> As you can see, uh, every field is stored by in, into this storage cell, which is default. So A, B, C, they all be in here. Uh, but our D value would have uh, the pointer to the other cell instead. So they will just simply reference something else for you. It would not be stored in, in this uh, zero cell. It would be stored by the address which we have given it or by some other address which would it would find for itself. Um, all right, uh, but uh, first of all, why would you want to use the lazy at all, right? And uh, what are the benefits? What are the disadvantages? Um, so uh, there's a lot to it actually, uh, but mostly, uh, for example, if you were to have some a big value, which you simply don't want to, to load every time you do some simple operation, you would typically assign it to lazy uh, so that it would load lazily. <laughs> lazily. It would not simply load every time you do something. It will load only when you request it to load via a get method. Um, likewise, if you want to store it back, um, you need to set it back as well. Uh, so it wouldn't do any anything atomically. You need to um, do these methods on your own. You will uh, be responsible for its behavior and you would uh, load it and offload it whenever you need and whenever you define it on in your code. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, what are the benefits then of non-lazy loading, non-eager loading, as they call it? Um, well, if you have some neat small types which do not require you to load a large amounts of space uh, and you will work with them all anyways, you can just eagerly load them and you'll be fine. Uh, no need to then take care of these gets and sets and other different stuff. Yeah, with lazy gets and sets can um, bring some very nasty bugs if you forget to do that. <laughs> and it's rather hard to track them as well. Um, yeah. Uh, so, with storage specifically, there's this other thing, which is ink preload. Uh, as you know, in ink contracts, we do not use a STD mode, and we are instead in no STD mode, uh, which forbids us from using uh, very nice and neat uh, containers, uh, uh, which are in the STD itself. And sometimes you very much need to, uh, there are a lot of methods in, for these containers, they are also uh, they can improve your performance if you use them correctly. Uh, but in ink environment specifically, you very, very much don't want to iterate over something. And if you are iterating over something, uh, you need to make sure that it is a, a finite iteration because uh, everything has a gas cost. And well, you are basically just uh, throwing your money away with uh, uh, iterations which you have not thought through properly. So be very careful. It's great power to use ink preload store and it is a great responsibility. Furthermore, um, furthermore, the default uh, storage mapping container is a lot more optimized for gas prices. If you don't need to do anything fancy, uh, you don't need the methods, you just need to store something and then get the value or do something like just very trivial, which is in the storage mapping container. Please do use the storage mapping container. It is the preferred one. It is optimized. It will save you money. It will save you time. It, it, it's just good. <laughs> use the vector stuff from a preview when you direly need it or when, um, I don't know, it is required uh, by the protocol or whatnot. Um, when it is required by the protocol, it will 
uh, very quiet in the places when it uh, not uh, puts your stuff in danger, specifically the gas. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's also the string notably a lot of different containers you can just look at the crate and find the useful stuff you need uh, there's also the code snippet for the prelude specifically for vector you can basically use it as shown uh, you can use the need macros for that as well I, I, I. But, uh, <laughs> You can use macros for that. You can initialize it with macros. You can use the pop function to get the last one. Uh, spoiler, it will be five for this specific one. Um, yeah, you can get just a vector of size 10 with all zeros and stuff like that. Neat, uh, but please do be very careful with it. Um, yeah, and storage goes hand in hand with contract upgradability. I will touch it very, very, very briefly. Um, so basically, um, sometimes you want to upgrade your contract. There's something, there's a change needed or uh, some functionality is obsolete. Uh, anything, anything can happen within your life, uh, the coding stuff and uh, you just sometimes want to do that. So the preferred method, there are several methods, uh, but the preferred method for ink specifically is uh, set code hash. Um, so what did, uh, this method basically do uh, previously in the previous lecture, uh, you gone through deploying the contracts as well. So basically when you deploy a contract, uh, you, uh, get the wasm file right and you get the hash of it and you put it somewhere up into your very nicely done blockchain uh, and this hash will reference uh, uh, your meta um, your wasm code so if you were to swap it for something instead say the hash is now a different hash and it uh, targets some different wasm code you would then use this code instead of the previous one. And you can obviously modify it uh, however you wish, almost. Um, there are a lot of limitations to it. You need to be very, very careful with upgrading uh, your smart contracts. Um, yeah, yeah, all the instances then of your contract uh, will use uh, the new uh, code, which is hashed. Uh, and um, yeah, there there are a few bugs with it as well. Like, uh, for example, some method panicked during the time you were um, upgrading your code, uh, and then it reverts everything back basically. So it would revert your uh, hash to the old one. So you make sure there are no operations running, nothing can break, everything is calm and then you do the upgrade. Now, in this code snippet, uh, you can see the set code uh, method, message, uh, and that's the basics of how you do that. Although, importantly, there's uh, a huge, huge, huge part of it missing, uh, which is security related. And uh, people who have some suspicions can now write something in chat, which we will later read through. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a very big security hole in the huge one, which is basically anyone can now address this message and anyone can then swap your code for something else. And you can imagine it could be bad. <laughs> uh, so to in order to ensure uh, that uh, only you or authorized users can access this method, you need to implement this ensure owner um, method and basically then limit uh, uh, those who can access this message and basically <clears throat> try and not break stuff around it. Um, 
Yeah, and so contract upgradability goes hand in hand with storage as well. Um, basically, you don't want to break your storage in any way. Um, refer to these code snippets. So say you have uh, this um, old fancy contract which has X and Y of types uh, unsigned 32 and bool, and then you want to change it to uh, basically pretty much the same, but uh, the order is different now. Um, now, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with it, but specifically, for example, you have this message, get values, which wants basically to get the values of this struct, right? Uh, and then you try to invoke this message, and uh, after you've upgraded your contract, you will get something you do not expect because, well, the struct uh, values are just um, kept in, in the storage without the names specifically, so it would just go by the order of it. Uh, yeah, and it'll break everything. So upgrading your contracts, you very much, very, very, very much don't want to do anything at all with your storage, anything at all with set code hash method specifically. Um, just, just just leave it be. <laughs> Make your workarounds if needed. Um, do some magic, but please don't touch the storage. Uh, changing uh, the order, changing the types, adding new stuff. Um, just, just don't. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, that would be all connect to storage, uh, we could uh, possibly now see the beautiful answers. I, I, hello. Um, and all the questions which were presented. Um, if you have any questions right now, feel free to ask. Um, there was one in the uh, chat section, when the question section, sorry, which I will um, show right now, which is like Solidity, does Inc. have nested mappings? Um, you can nest stuff, yes. Good, all right, good point. Uh, let's see, um, any other questions? I see people typing. To see what ink prelude adds, just refer to the crate. It has everything. You can basically <clears throat> look it up on your own and you will see every option. Uh, so there's uh, this doc page on docs.rs uh, and there's the ink prelude stuff in there. You can just <clears throat> go through it neatly. I uh, will post the link. Go. Yeah, and there's another uh, link in there as well. Yeah, I approve. I approve of the link. <laughs> um, I'll read out the question because uh, there will be people that will be watching uh, the recording, so I would prefer they know what uh, the question is. So Mork's asking. Uh, oops, question moved, moved a bit. Uh, because some of what ink uh, prelude adds would error with, uh, without um, without STD, uh, but some of it will not because of it didn't replace an STD version. Did I get that right? You do not use STD at all. You actually even add the no STD at the beginning of your contract to specifically say that you are not using the STD at all. Uh, STD is not optimized for smart contract environment. It will just eat through your gas. So don't use the STD. As a matter of fact, I think uh, our contracts palette will specifically say you not to use it. But is there anything for which that is not the case? Oh, what specifically, sorry? <laughs> Yeah, more, let's be a bit more specific so I can actually give you a to the point answer. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine, Mok. Okay, uh, Mok will come uh, with his question a bit later. 
I can see Frank typing as well. Can you show an example of your favorite ink ripples and elaborate storage? <laughs> well, it's all pretty much open source. Uh, you can look up any projects from Aleph Zero, go ahead, uh, look up how we manage the storage. There's a lot of good examples in there. Just get uh, uh, Aleph Zero, you, you'll find a lot. Um, yeah, so the reason why a lot of people are also asking is because they're interested in example projects because, again, from one of the bounties that uh, people can actually win some prizes out of is basically deploying some of the uh, some already existing projects or porting projects that, uh, uh, from EVM to, uh, to Inc., uh, which will allow them to be in competition for some of the prizes. So, yes, that's why uh, repositories that utilize Inc. properly are, are of interest. So if you have any uh, direct examples that you can share, that would be really useful for everyone. And again, these will be shared with the rest of the cohort uh, and participants uh, in the hackathon. Yeah, sure. Uh, could I possibly share it on some Discord then for everybody to see? Um, yes, you can uh, you, you can use the Discord channels as well for the hackathon. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just go ahead and do that. Uh, I get my hands on it. And any any other questions? A few people typing. We do have a bit more time, so uh, everyone, please feel free to post your questions. <coughs> Solidity versus ink. Um, uh, yeah, there, there's been a few slides with that with Pete as well. <laughs> Basically, uh, we use the Rust environment, hence uh, ink is a lot more preferable for Aleph Zero specifically. So we use that. <clears throat> well, it has all the benefits of Rust except for VST. <laughs> so yeah, basically, neat stuff with macros. Uh, uh, it's pretty quick as well. And I mean, you, you can look it up at Pete's presentation. That was a perfect slide for that. I think Mo finally managed to formulate this question properly. So. Maybe. Oh my God, that's a lot of <laughs> Well, with Rust, uh, you specifically uh, use something like you, you say, that I want uh, this crate to, to, and this uh, type from the crate and this method of the type of the crate. So there wouldn't be any collisions like that, I believe. Um, so if there is a collision, you just specify what specifically what you want to use at the point. <laughs> Mox says, gotcha. Okay, so <laughs> I was expecting another paragraph to come in, uh, but happy to have that uh, question resolved. Um, right. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. Is there anything else, Vlad, that you would like to address? Um, hmm. Well, there's a lot of documentation online, so go ahead and use that. <laughs> uh, there's the documentation on the Aleph official web page. We have a wonderful Git book. There's, there's a lot of examples on how you do stuff. There's also the uh, Substrate uh, forum. You can address people in their own. You can use the wonderful search function, which works. And uh, you can possibly find uh, this re resolution for some of your uh, troubles. Uh, also, there's the Git. Uh, Git has a lot of wonderful examples. Uh, you can look it up on Aleph's Git, for example, our variety stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, there's stuff to look at on the internet as well. Don't forget about it. <laughs> Great. Um, Jorge is asking, I have late, where can I find the recording? Uh, as always, all of our sessions will be recorded and we will be adding them both to the Hacker Pack as well as post them uh, in uh, uh, in Discord. So we have a dedicated club room section. So if you're not part of it, please make sure to just head over and explore. Uh, all the videos will be posted there. Um, Mox is asking, yes, and also miss some workshops. Uh, do you do clashes? Do you know in general what time the recordings will be available? Again, we posted a couple of things. The ones from yesterday were posted in chat. And again, we will add them to the Hacker Pack so you will be able to explore and um, you know listen through uh, to your convenience. Um, hopefully, it should be done. Um, uh, the yesterday's ones are already available again. Uh, yeah, I will check if they're in the Hacker Pack already. If not, I will add them. Um, if uh, And the ones from today, Probably sometime tomorrow afternoon, uh, once we're done with the editing and um, 
you know, post-production, uh, everything should be fine and uh, available. Great. Uh, hope that answers all the questions. Uh, but thank you for, for, for being here for, for, for this workshop. And again, for everyone that's already here, don't, don't forget that we will be having uh, another one at uh, uh, 6 p.m. Central European time, uh, which will be on uh, Scaffold Your Dap with Inkathon. Um, so do tune in uh, for the one and about now and a half. Thank you all for being here. See you all. <laughs> See you. Thank you. <laughs>